Hi, I'm Ruth Moore. I teach at Santa Rosa Middle School, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of my students. I'm going to start with my student, Jeremiah, who joined our class mid-year. He was expelled from our campus last year, and he was returning from the alternative school. He's a Pomo Indian, and he had some personal tragedy in his life. He rarely made it to school every day. On this particular day in our classroom, we were discussing what makes, excuse me, <laughs> we were discussing a Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech in order to prepare them to deliver their own speeches and part of our study of the civil rights movement. So I asked my class, what makes a speech powerful? My straight A student said strong grammatical structures. After a few similar responses, Jeremiah raised his hand when you tell the truth. You see, despite his recent history, Jeremiah had become an integral and important part of our classroom community. And his insights always raised the bar for our level of dialogue. And even though he was sort of deemed a failure by the mainstream grading system, I know that Jeremiah and our class were transformed by his presence this year. In fact, he confided in me, I used to be ashamed to be an Indian, but I'm not anymore. My student Elena was a bright but shy student in my advanced class. She struggled with some of the writing assignments at the beginning of the year and I started to wonder if she was correctly placed until I assigned her the role of Samuel Adams in our simulation of the debate surrounding colonial independence. And she represented those founding father arguments so forcefully that day that the Patriots won the debate hands down. I knew then that Elena actually had quite a bit to say. So, she took on a very courageous topic for her independent research project. What causes homophobia? Through research and interviews and involvement with the local gay community, she came to some very thoughtful conclusions for herself. But I knew that something truly important had happened for Elena when she wrote me to say that she was not only planning to attend the upcoming Pride Parade, she was planning to be in it. So both the stories of Jeremiah and Elena, whose names I've changed to protect their privacy, illustrate what I'm truly passionate about in my teaching, and that is helping students find their voice, creating the conditions that encourage them to take risks, test their voices in a trusting community, and ultimately grow into their larger selves. I want to hear their stories and their ideas into speech, help them make those vital connections between the subject matter and their own lives, and feel the transformative power of knowing that their voices matter. Like my student, Bella, who survived one of the most frightening episodes a teenager can face, an attempt to take her own life. Several months later, we were making connections between Shakespeare and our own lives, and Bella was particularly resonating with a line from Much Ado About Nothing. She died whilst her slander lived. And she was able to articulate this truth about herself. When I let the rumors about my life control me, I died inside. When I let them go, I could live again. I want my students to have the freedom to express and explore some of their most deeply held beliefs, consider alternative perspectives, and in doing so, connect their own story to a bigger story, their own world to a wider one. Like my student Stuart a few years ago, who expressed his adamant atheist beliefs in every class discussion, every chance he got, until one day we read a story about children who were brainstormed into giving up their religious beliefs. And he realized for himself, I always thought that religion was wrong, but now I know that having the freedom to choose is more important. So how do we create a space where students, young people, teenagers, feel free to explore and express these kinds of big ideas? First, we have to make the space absolutely safe. And that's why I use a heavy hand with put-downs at the beginning of the school year. In fact, no put-downs is one of only five guidelines in my class. And I don't mean just verbal put-downs. Do you remember yourselves at 13? I tell them eye rolling, facial expressions, body language, all of those are put downs. And I zealously enforce that expectation. And I tell them why. Because we are building a community where every single person needs to feel free to say what they really think and feel. Next, I practice deep listening. I listen hard, not only for what my students say on the surface, but what unexplored ripples might lay beneath. I play their words back to them and the words of their classmates, and I invite them to compare. And I strive not to judge, no matter how tempting. So when one of my most flamboyant, outspoken students announced at the beginning of the school year that she thought all of history was a lie and that therefore our class was a waste of time, 
I listen patiently. <laughs> Which brings me to my next practice, that of asking good questions. I want to know more about what my students think and why. And so I ask them, what makes you think that? Tell me more about that. What examples support what you think? What do you think about what your classmate who thinks the opposite of you just said? As much as possible, I try to use their own words in framing my questions. And that's why at the beginning of the year, we spend a good chunk of time learning how to ask good open-ended questions of each other in partners, in groups, and in whole class. Because I want my class to continue being the kind of place where a student might say, I never thought of it that way. Or I just changed my mind because of what my classmate just said. Or even more important, where perceptions of each other can change. Like when my middle class white student, Eleanor, said of a student from a different background, I never knew how smart you were because I've never heard you talk in a class like this. I found that these practices lead to strong academic results for all my students, including my English learners. So much so that one year, the API for this particular subgroup at our site rose over 50 points. And every, virtually every English learner in my class was deemed proficient on the district-wide benchmark writing exam. That's why I was shocked and dismayed when I was asked to use a scripted curriculum with our struggling learners as part of our program improvement efforts several years ago. It was a program devoid of everything I cared about most deeply. How could I connect my students to the wider world without the use of authentic literature and meaningful writing assignments? How could I teach my students how to think critically when I was being asked not to think critically? Most of all, how could I create that vital dynamic space where students were free to explore if I didn't have the flexibility and freedom to do so? When I expressed my concerns, I was told that I was not a team player. <laughs> I became demoralized and disillusioned. And I call this the worst year of my teaching soul. How could I connect with my students if I was struggling to enact a program that was incompatible with my most deeply held convictions as an educator? How could I help my students find their voice if I'd lost my own? In a midnight moment of desperation, I stumbled on a poem by Parker Palmer entitled, The Tragic Gap. About the gap between our current reality and what we dream is possible and the courage that it takes to stand in that gap. Wow, did that resonate with me. This led me to an organization called the Center for Courage and Renewal, and I ended up attending a series of retreats aimed at renewing teachers. And it was in this setting that relied on the Quaker principles of deep listening and asking good open-ended questions that I was able to reconnect with my authentic self, name and claim my own narrative, and rejoin soul with role. I felt empowered to begin attending public meetings and using the very same strategies that had supported me and that I employed in the classroom to speak my truth to power. I began simply by asking for the research behind certain programs and policies. And I voiced my observation when I saw a deep disconnect between frontline educators like myself and policymakers. Right. And slowly, I began to feel some conversations shift. I had learned the hard way what one of my husband's favorite professors expressed in joke form. There was a school that was using several practical, successful strategies on the front line until a visitor, visiting administrator commented, but it'll never work in theory. <laughs> and so I learned that a dream I held for my students was one I needed to claim for myself. I needed to work with integrity from my deepest self. I needed to exercise my own voice in the wider world and feel its power and vitality. And when I did these things, I was able to turn around and once again give those gifts to my students. I was able to fiercely protect the emotional safety of our classroom, practice deep listening, and ask good questions. And when I do these things, I find that my students are much more likely to show up with their authentic selves and even be willing to grow into something more, like I did. This reminds me of what one of my own best professors said, that maybe the purpose of education is to induct a person into that eternal human conversation that began long before we were all born and will continue long after we are gone. Not only that, but these seemingly soft skills are amongst the most highly prized, 
by both colleges and employers. In a recent survey released by the National Association of Colleges and Employers, the three most sought after skills were in this order, ability to work in a team structure, ability to make decisions and solve problems, and the ability to communicate verbally with people inside and outside an organization. And that is why one of my most treasured compliments as a teacher is this. In Ms. Moore's class, every voice counts. It reminds me of a quote by John Steinbeck entitled A Former Teacher, which I keep pinned with a daisy magnet to my metal filing cabinet to remind me of my own best teachers and of the teacher I hope to be. It reads, in her classroom, our speculations range the world. We came to her each morning carrying new truths, new facts. She breathed curiosity into us, and we brought them cupped in our hands, cupped and shielded in our hands like fireflies. When she went away, a sadness came over us, but the light did not go out. She had written her signature on us, the literature of the teacher who writes on children's minds. Many teachers have taught me soon forgotten things, but only a few like her created in me a new direction, a new hunger, a new attitude. In many ways, I am the unsigned manuscript of that teacher. What deathless power lies in the hands of such a person? I didn't go into teaching to be powerful, except in this way. If I can help birth the voices of the next generation in a trusting community where they truly learn to hear each other, who knows what power will be unleashed beyond the walls of our classroom. And if we give our ourselves the same gift, we embody the very dream that we dream for our students, to feel the full power and potential of our own voices in the wider world, and by standing courageously in the tragic gap, impact the greater good. Because after all, no matter who we are, our voices matter. <laughs>